Brought to you by Incogni. All right, we've done theater, we've done painting, we've done wine, and now it's time to do some drinking stuff in general. And to start, let us learn about the drinking cultures of the world. Welcome to my private jet. Come on, kid, I got a lot to teach you about the world. We must learn all of the drinking customs of all the funny foreign places. Starting with where drinking was invented. The country of Uck. The trick is to jump just before you hit the ground. Observe British people in their natural habitat. Here they do a thing called cheers, where they clink their glasses together before drinking. The tradition dates back centuries, but the origin, why they started doing it, is somewhat unknown. But we have a couple of theories. Theory one, poisoning. Yes, so imagine a situation like this. Two people who don't trust each other, sitting down together at the pub. This guy then does something shady to the other guy's drink. Here you go. Did you poison my drink? Me? I would never. Well then, I'll pour a little of mine into yours, and you can pour a little of yours into mine, and we'll both either be totally fine, or both totally dead. No, no, there's, there's no need to do that. So that was the initial version, and then eventually they just kind of shortcutted it to, yeah, clink clink, it's fine, I trust you. But, that's probably a myth. So, theory number two. Ghosts. Right, in the Middle Ages, people were worried about spooky ghosts and spirits. So they do cheers very loudly to scare away the demons. Also, sometimes you'd spill some of your drink onto the table and the floor, and then that was like a little offering to the spirit. But that's probably also not true. The most likely answer is simply that everyone likes that sound. Ah, it's very satisfying. There's more. You know when someone drops a glass and everyone just kind of silent, like, oh, you fucking idiot. Well, in the UK, instead, everyone goes, way in celebration, as a way to make fun of you, but also make you feel not so bad. Uh-oh. The BBC? They have a whole organization for that now? We gotta get out of here. We'll take my private cruise ship. Come, come, to Italy, where they filmed the Mario movie. Let me just park this here. Chai, this is actually real. Come this way to the Leaning Tower of Pizza held up by the raw strength of a thousand tourists posing for photographs. But did you know that Italians, when they say cheers, say chin chin? Now, that is very funny to the Japanese, because in Japanese, chin chin means penis. Germany next. Now here they do Bruderschaft, where you link your arms together when drinking. It's also kind of seen all over the world at weddings in particular, but only the Germans have a name for it. It symbolizes the end of formalities between two people. But the Germans have a lot more. Now, when you clink glasses together with someone, you have to look them directly in the eye. And if you don't do it, you will be cursed with seven years of bad sex, apparently. It's not my fault, it's the Germans. Then when doing shots in Germany, they sometimes also go Zermit, and you hold the glass near your belly. Zertit, and you hold it near your chest. And then Zumsack, and you hold it near your, you know. And then Zack Zack, and you drink. Now, on to Finland. They keep it casual. They have a custom specifically for drinking alone. You're supposed to do it while loafing around in your underpants, and it's called Kalsari Kani, also known as underwear drunk. All right, that's all I could find on Finland. So off to Canada. To get there, I booked us a private fishing trawler. It's so exclusive that even these fish, yes, they go to a private school. In Newfoundland, Canada, they have the Newfoundland Screech. You take a shot of Screech and then you do the Screech. It goes like this. Is you a screecher? And then you answer like this. Deed I am, me old cock, and long may your big jib jaw. That's it. It's a pirate culture. Then they take a big fish, usually a cod, 
and they kiss it on the lips. Anyway, I'm kind of I'm kind of busy, so uh, there's no more customs anywhere in the world. You can do some more, maybe uh, independent research yourself. I'll, I'll see you back in the field. Okay, this next section is on cocktails. So it all started when we made this asset where the Irish character, he's shaking a cocktail at a frat party, and I turned to the editor and I went, wait a minute, that's a weird word. Why are they called cocktails? And we started Googling it, and we kind of went down a rabbit hole, and it was actually really interesting. So here it is. Cocktails. In the 1700s, fuel prices were outrageous. So everybody used the horse. Now, horses weren't just used for travel. They were also used for work in the fields. So you would sometimes put a harness on a horse for plowing a field, right? Now, when you do that, its tail actually gets in the way. And so we have to do something about that thing. Think of it like the foreskin of the horse. You put it in the guillotine and everybody closes their eyes. Problem solved. Now, this practice is called docking. It has a different meaning these days. So once the tail is docked, some say it's much easier to clean. But it also kind of looks like a chicken's tail, right? Hence, they would call these tails cocktails. So that's step one in the story. Step two, you've also got horse merchants, right? And they are a very shrewd bunch. They know that when they sell their horses, the customer wants very feisty and energetic animals. Someone who's buying a horse doesn't want one that's kind of sickly or lazy or sleeping all the time, right? They need it for work. So how do you ensure, then, that your horse looks full of beans and moxie and some other stuff and has the maximum horsepower possible when it's time to sell? Well, they would use this one quick hack. All the equestrians hate them. They would go over to their mortar and pestle and they would throw in some chili, hmm, some ginger, and a few other spices and just mix it all together. Then... They would go over to the horse, and hold still, little fella, and with the mixture go up into the no-no area. Now, the horse doesn't like that very much, so it's kicking, it's going mad, and the bidders are all going, wow, this is a really great horse, it's got some spunk, I tell ya, I'm buying it. So the horse merchants made a whole bunch of money, and everyone was happy. Well... Almost everyone. The end. Of step two. Now step three. Around the same time, you've got bartenders over in the saloon, and they have just invented the science of mixology. They've realized that you can add Red Bull and lemon juice to stuff and actually make alcohol not taste so bad. But when they added some ginger and spices and maybe a little bit of pepper, people went, oh, I know these. These are those horse suppositories. <laughs> Cocktails, we'll call them. Glug, 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 glug. And the name stuck. Do you think it's too early for ad time? I don't think it's too early for ad time. Oh no, help me, Incogni Man. I signed up for discounts at a retail store and they won't stop sending me messages. Huh? I signed up to that website years ago. Why are they still spamming me? That would be my doing. I am Data Beast Man. Who will, will stop, stop him? him? It's me, Incogni Man. Incogni is the brilliant service that tells a whole bunch of databases and people who have your data and stuff to get fucking lost. It says, hey, do you have this email address? Well, lose it. Hey, marketer man, you can't use this phone number anymore. Instead of chasing them all up manually by signing up to Incogni, they send these legal requests on your behalf to get you deleted from the internet. Let us do battle in my room. And then we teleport to the desert. I better follow him. Incogni portal. Good of you to finally join us. Yeah, well I'm gonna stop you. <laughs> 
incognito lawyer powers, legal threats, data removal tools, Consumer Privacy Act, data protection regulations, polite yet stern wording. It has created a Gundam. So go to incogni.com slash incognito. Sign up today and get 60% off an annual plan. I won't change numbers. I won't change email addresses. I'll just simply take them back. I can feel it working. My phone isn't ringing as often. My email inbox, it's less full with just a whole bunch of shit. And then I like the sun. I've got the clouds clear. My databases are getting too light. I'm floating away. He'll die of the cold eventually. <laughs> Pan up and it's an old man. He's like, not bad, kid. <laughs> not bad at all. <gasps> so go to incogni.com slash incognito. Sign up today and get 60% off an annual plan. Add over. Have you heard about the latest dangerous trend? It's all over social media. Wine mixed with watermelon. A combination when mixed together makes a deadly poison. Here we are in Argentina with a delicious watermelon. Now let me chase it down with a glass of <gasps> wine. Okay, it's not true. But it's been a myth in South America for over a hundred years that you should never pair wine and watermelon together. No one quite knows why, but we dug and we dug and we were able to find a single source from an author, Facundo de Genova. And he says in probably Argentina, probably sometime in the 1800s, there was a small Catholic church and everything was great for a time. They grew wine for dinner and watermelon for dessert. Until one day, something bad happened in their idyllic little town. A few men in the village started getting a bit... Mm, grabby. It was a whole Me Too thing, but it was the first Me Too. It was a Me One. No one quite knows who did what to whom, but it was a big scandal, I tell you. And it kept... Happen. Oh no, what's happening to our beautiful our village? They said in their funny foreign accents. Now, presiding over the village was a monastery. So the priests all gathered together at this monastery to figure out what the hell's going on with all this grabbiness. Yeah, this a town of sucks now, said the women folk. I hope you have the plan to fix a this. Uh, yes, of course we do. But first, we must figure out why the men are becoming so grabby. Come on, guys, think outside the box. We have to find something, anything to blame, except the people who actually did the thing. So the priests began looking at the diets of the people in the village. Hmm, the priest said aloud. One of the monks proposed a theory. Have you noticed that we grow a lot of grapes here? Yes. And have you noticed that we also grow a lot of watermelon? Yeah. Well, what if, you know, Somehow, it makes the men folk grabby. That must be it. We must put a stop to this. But how? Well, let's tell them that if they drink wine and eat watermelon, they'll go to hell. Okay, so that's what they did. Hear ye, hear ye, do not drink wine and then eat watermelon. You'll go to hell. Oh, really? Uh, really? Uh, really? Uh, really? Uh, really? I don't know that. Uh, really? Maybe it's really, really, really? And it worked. The assaults suddenly stopped. Hurrah! Although whether that was a coincidence, we don't actually know. Over time, however, the messaging kind of evolved. Because don't mix wine with watermelon isn't exactly a well-known Bible proverb, and people became less religious. So instead of, you'll go to hell, the line changed to, it's poison and you'll die. And in Argentina, in some places, the myth still perpetuates. Now, is there actually any evidence at all that pairing wine and watermelon together really causes the mood. Kinda. Watermelon contains an amino acid, arginine, which partially transforms into nitric oxide, and then nitric oxide is a vasodilator. And vasodilators uh, do this. Plus, wine also has polyphenols, and that also helps in the formation of nitric oxide, so Double this. But the effect from nitric oxide is actually very mild. 
Also, all of these foods have polyphenols and arginine in them as well. So pretty much everything has it. So, no, the effects are likely hugely overstated. So, the moral of the story is... This next section is on wine in the Bible. Sort of. Apologies if we got any details wrong, we mostly kept this section because we liked the pun on Eucharist. Jumping forward to Jesus. This is his first recorded miracle. So, Jesus and a whole bunch of his followers and stuff, they are invited to a wedding in Cana. Now, the waiter goes over to serve some guests some wine, and, uh-oh. It's empty. What do you mean it's empty? There's no more wine. No, wait, I've got a plan, says Jesus. Bring me six big stone jugs, about 20 to 30 gallons each, and fill them up to the brim with H2O. Now, check out this. And he does the finger thing. And then when they went to pour the water, suddenly it was wine. And it was the best wine that anyone had ever had. And they go, oh, that's pretty good, Jesus. But have you got any other miracles? And he says, yes. Come on, we're going to do a supper. Now, everyone is gathered around, and this is the point at which Jesus reveals, by the way, one of you is very sus. I know one of you will betray me. And he looks at Judas, and Judas is kind of looking away. But then Da Vinci's like, Guys, uh, I need you to stay uh, still for the painting. So Jesus goes, watch this. And he takes some bread and wine, and he says, Look at this bread. This is my flesh. And everyone's kind of like, really? And he goes, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're Protestant, then just metaphorically. No, no, okay, look at this wine. It is my blood. Really? Quit making this so complicated. Here, have some. So he hands it to his disciples and they went, fantastic, I was peckish and thirsty. And he goes, yes, in fact, I shall call this little celebration a Eucharist or Holy Communion. It will be the practice of eating one cracker or piece of bread and drinking some wine. And if you eat the whole thing and drink the whole bottle, that's called a huge caress. Now, most Christians today take that as a symbolic thing, unless you are Catholic. Now, they believe in what's called transubstantiation, which means that the bread and wine literally turns into the body and blood of Jesus at the moment that they are consumed. However, it does still look like bread and wine, and they call that phenomenon appearance or accident. It has changed, but you just can't tell. Except for sometimes when you actually can. Lanciano, Italy, in the 8th century, there is a monk and he has been on r slash atheism for far too long. He is starting to have doubts about the blood and wine stuff, but he still has his monkly responsibilities. So, he holds mass and he says the words of consecration, this is my body, this is my blood, this is my rifle, this is my gun, and at that very moment, the bread turns into literal flesh in his hands. And the wine turned to blood. Jesus, man. Holy shit, said everybody in unison. And ironically, he went, oh, well, I should probably not eat this then. So instead, he kept it in this chalice thing. What is it? A clock? Anyway, there it remains still today, kept in the church of San Francesco. And now a couple of years later, in the 1970s, Professor Odaro Leone decides, let me do a bit of an experiment. So he took a sample of the flesh and he came to the conclusion that it was indeed real. Apparently, it was part of a heart valve and that the blood type was AB. The sample has not been analyzed since. However, it is officially recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. Here ends the reading. Now, you might say, wow, that section really doesn't have a whole lot to do with wine. And in fact, you're just badly retelling a Bible story. This final section we started making for the main channel when we found this massive court document and we thought, holy shit, this is a hell of a story. And we had all these ideas of it being like Witcher themed. And so there were quite a few like random Witcher assets. Just ignore that. But it just kept blooming and blooming into this bigger story and it got too long. 
And so here it is on Incognito. And here we begin in 1743. The birth of Thomas Jefferson. Push, Mrs. Jefferson, push. Now, Tom Jeff, yeah. he was involved with some politics, kind of sexy, but you're too late, he's dead. But what's more important is he tried his hand at a lot of different hobbies. Architecture, he designed his own home in Monticello. He played the violin. He kept mockingbirds. He collected fossils. And, most relevant of all, he hoarded a culture. In his extensive garden, he kept 330 types of vegetables and 170 types of fruit. One of those fruits was grapes. So he tried his hand at viniculture. And while he was good at a lot of things, he never saw much success with making wine. So he mostly collected the stuff. Now, people naturally wondered, like, hey, what happened to the wine he made and the wine he collected? Did he sell it all? Did he give it away? Did he attempt the huge caress? Fast forward, 1985. Meet German music producer Hardy Rodenstock. He is an avid wine collector. And he's tapping on the walls of old buildings in Paris, looking for some national treasures. On this occasion, the wall opened and, my God. Sealed behind, he said that he found a collection of 24 bottles, dating all the way back to the 1780s and, <gasps> Look at that. THJ engraved right there on the glass. Thomas Jefferson. It seems like Mr. Rodenstock has stumbled upon Jeff's hidden collection. Mystery solved. And it would make sense that they wound up in France because Jefferson spent a number of years over there. Amazing. And into Rodenstock's wine collection, they went. Now, Rodenstock's wine collection was something quite special, and he liked to show it off. So every year he would host tasting events that featured extremely rare wines. And he would invite all the most prominent German celebrities, such as the Hans Brothers, and Das Boot, Was. and Death Stranding. Now, one of his guests was a guy named Michael Broadbent, the senior director for Christie's Auction House. Together, they cracked open one of the THJ bottles. Bottle number one. Broadbent said that the wine was delicious. Yup, these bottles are in perfect condition, he said. You should really auction these things. I run an auction, you should put them in there. Huh, maybe I should, said Mr. Rodenstock. Maybe I should. But before they did that, they sold two of the bottles privately. Number two and number three. And they drank a fourth. On the 5th of December 1985, they put up bottle number five for auction at Christie's. It was bought by Christopher Forbes for £105,000, which at the time meant it was the most expensive bottle of wine ever sold. But that wine wasn't to drink. Proudly, that thing sat on the Forbes shelf, eventually to be put into the Forbes gallery in the exhibit on former presidents. And funnily enough, they actually put this bottle on display under big industrial lights and it heated the thing something fierce. And the heat ruined its drinkability, of course. In fact, so intense was the light that the glass expanded and the cork fell into the bottle. Some time passed. They celebrated the sale with another drink. Bottle number six, now gone. And then they sold two more privately. In 1987, they drank bottle number 9. 1988, they drank bottle number 10. And at this point, a new challenger enters the sea. The White Wolf of Palm Beach. They call him Bill Coke. Some say it's short for billionaire. He's a member of one of the wealthiest families in America. And he is also one of the world's most avid collectors of wine. So, they sell him a total of four bottles for $311,804. We're way over here on the graph at this point. So, gently, careful, careful now, he put them in his climate-controlled cellar, and he would show them off to his friends. Otherwise, here they remained for the next 17 years. As the years ticked by, more bottles were sold and more bottles were consumed, until there were none left. 2005. The four Coke bottles had sat around for a long time on the shelf. 
doing nothing. When something new happened. The Boston Museum of Fine Arts was interested in displaying the bottles and wanted to trace the exact provenance. So Coke gets on the line with the Jefferson Foundation and he goes, oh, look, I don't mean to brag, but I'm about to have my bottles displayed at the Boston Museum. But I need just a little bit of verification. Could you tell me exactly where these bottles come from? And the Thomas Jefferson Foundation responded, oh, I'm afraid we can't do that. We don't think they're real. Eh? Yeah. In fact, you're not the only person to call about this. What? Yes, it was in the 80s. A Mr. Broadbent, I believe, of Christie's Auction House called up trying to verify the bottles so that he could sell them. But we looked through our comprehensive historical records and found no mention of these bottles. Here's a letter we sent saying that we couldn't verify them. And they're probably fake. But, 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 he sold those bottles to me. Now, back to 1776. Now, here's a thing you should know about Jefferson. Let's just say, if he was around today, he would play a lot of Factorio. He was, you know. And I have the largest collection of Funko Pops in the world. And that meant that his record keeping was very meticulous. All of his anime was ordered alphabetically. And so too were all the things that he ever purchased, including wine. So that's my story, Mr. Pepsi. And those bottles are probably fake. When Coke hears about this, he hangs up the phone and hits speed dial on his pager or something. And he, I need to assemble a team, a team of investigators. Mr. Rodenstock lived in Germany, so Coke's investigators scoured the countryside for clues, and eventually they found a lead. They managed to track down five German residents who claimed to have done engraving work for Rodenstock in the past. They said, hey, have you seen these bottles before? And they went, oh yeah, we have. We did those. And all five were certain that the THJ engravings were done by an electric power tool. Every one of these 24 bottles of Jefferson wine were fake. Big, fat phonies. Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. So, Bill takes all of this evidence to court, and Rodenstock is summoned, but he doesn't show up. So Bill wins in absentia, and is awarded a million bucks. In the end, Bill never received any money from Rodenstock. But to Bill, it was about sending a message more than receiving any money. I'm coming after you. And it's just one battle of many that Bill has fought against counterfeit wine. In 2008, Coke filed a consumer fraud lawsuit against the Chicago Wine Company, which was later settled out of court. Another time, Coke spent $3.5 million buying nearly 2,700 bottles of wine from Zaki's auction house. Almost a third of a million dollars worth was fake. The auction house settled out of court, but the seller was told to pay $379,000 in damages and another $1,000 for every bottle. But then the next day, they went, you know what, we thought about it. This jury has decided to award you $12 million in punitive damages. Jackpot, said Mr. Coke. I'm rich. But a year later, the court changed its mind and awarded Coke only $711,000. Okay, so this guy's like a one-man army, and he's going around trying to scare the shit out of anyone who's selling fake wine. Oh, you've got expensive rare wine, do you? Uh... Yeah, I'll buy it then. Yeah, but no, yeah, I'll buy it. No, it's fine. It's genuine, is it? Yeah, you're saying it's genuine. Yeah, definitely. And then he goes and he inspects it, then finds it's fake, and then goes, yeah, I knew all along, stupid. Lawsuit time. By doing this, he's very slowly cleaning up the market. After all of these investigations, Bill has spent around $35 million tracking down fake wine. But by 2016, Coke was ready to lay down his weapons. He sold off a big chunk of his collection, and it sold for $22 million. Which means he likely did not break even. So consider giving to his GoFundMe. Now this is actually just a very small part of the story. This scandal ended up making such waves across the wine industry that they decided to make a movie about it. Based on the Benjamin Wallace book, The Billionaire's Vinegar. And it was set to star Brad Pitt. No, wait, now it's Matthew McConaughey. No, wait, it looks like it's cancelled.
All right, that's the video. Thanks for watching. Four more to go, but we've already started in on the regular type stuff in case you don't love fancy. Okay, bye. And don't forget, incognito.com slash incognito.